see everybody this morning and good to see you out there joining us cyberspace nice to have you uh, come into our our family room our inner circle here for our study this morning but before we uh, get to that we want to have opening prayer so I'll just get everybody here <coughs> bow their head okay let's pray together okay okay father we want to thank you uh, Lord most of all for your many blessings you've given us life this morning opportunity to be here and to not only fellowship with one another, but also to praise you for your many wonderful miracles in our lives, for watching over us, protecting us. Uh, Lord, we can do nothing else but trust in you. And uh, you make a way where sometimes there doesn't seem to be one. So thank you for all that you do for us and that we have this opportunity to come together uh, freely at this point and uh, open your words and, and <clears throat> study your word. Lord, we, we, we want to lift up to you uh, this morning uh, a number of prayer requests. Uh, there are folks that uh, have picked up a virus or illness. We ask that you would be with them. Um, you know that some of them like to tune in and watch our service, or, <clears throat> or some of them like to come over, but uh, they're ill this, this week. So we pray, Lord, that you will uh, be with them, help them through their illness. And uh, it's just incredible all the, <clears throat> all the sickness that's out there. <clears throat> this weekend, we uh, we do ask that as we as we come to you, that you will bless us with the, the presence of your Holy Spirit. We need insight, we need understanding, instruction to to follow, uh, to be ready for the things that are coming upon the world. So <clears throat> help us in that regard. Help us to prepare uh, not only spiritually and mentally, but also physically. Uh, help us to be more aware of the circumstances in the world. And most of all, Lord, we, we need to be used by you in the finishing of your great work. So accomplish that in us. It's a, it's a long list. We're very needy, and we uh, trust that you'll come through for us. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 All right, so as you know, we've been going through um, our story time. And uh, Noah, you probably like that. Uh, we gotta talk louder because we don't have the shotgun mic like today. Oh, okay. All right. You wait on me. Should I sit over here closer to the camera? Is that the idea? The audio? Let's read the story. All right. We are in chapter seven. It's called a mission field right here. So last week, remember what happened? that uh, they had a baby on the way and then she'd sold everything, all of the china and stuff that they had for when they got married. <clears throat> Bristol, Mary Muller exclaimed, whatever makes you think we should move to Bristol? Can't we stay where we are at least until the baby comes? She brushed tears from her eyes as she spoke. George put his arm around his wife. Mary, he said gently, I told you and I told the whole congregation I would stay here only as long as God called me to. But George, how could you be so sure, she asked. George was silent for a long moment. It was hard to explain, but the more he had prayed about it, the more he knew God was calling him northward to Bristol. Henry Craig was already living there, and he had written to George encouraging him to visit. In April of 1832, George had taken him up on the offer. Bristol was a bustling port city, second only to Liverpool in the number of ships it serviced. Like any other English city in the early 19th century, it was smoking and dirty. Beggars stood on the street corners and small dirty children weaved through the crowds, no doubt looking for a purse to snatch or a pocket to pick. Yet for all its crime and poverty, or rather because of it, George had felt that Bristol was a city he could work in, a city that needed plenty of help. George and Henry Craig had had tip ten days of meetings in the, at the Gideon and Pithe chapels in the city. Each night was busier than the night before, until on April 29th, Gideon Chapel was filled to overflowing. People sat on the stairs, others gathered outside the open windows, and still more 
crammed into the foyer in the back of the chapel. Many others had to be turned away because there was simply no more room for any of them. After the meeting, many of the regular members of the congregation at Gideon Chapel begged George to move to Bristol. George and Henry talked long into the night about it, finally drawing up a list of requirements that the congregation would need to agree on before George would even consider such a move. One, George Mueller and Henry Craig would not be traditional pastors asking the congregation or board members what they thought best for them to do in every situation. Rather, they needed to be free to do whatever they felt God was calling them to do. Two, all pew rents were to be abolished and neither man would be paid a salary. Together, the pastors and the congregation would trust God for enough money to run the chapel and meet all their needs. Three, George and Henry would be joint pastors working together as a team without one being senior and the other the junior pastor. George knew these were not easy conditions for a church to meet, and when he received a letter from Henry saying the congregation had agreed to all of them, he began to feel he should give serious consideration to a move to Bristol. As he prayed long and hard about it, he knew deep down that it was indeed time to leave Tainleth for Bristol. <clears throat> Finally, Mary sighed. Do what you think is best, George. I am sure I can have the baby just as well in Bristol as I could here, although I will miss all of my friends. George had compassion for his wife. He lived in many places, but she had been in Devon all her life. He knew it would be hard for her to make new friends, but he was sure he was doing the right thing. That's it then, he concluded. I'll start visiting everyone in the congregation tomorrow and tell them of our plans myself. <clears throat> so two days and many tears later, George had told everyone in the Ebenezer Chapel that he was moving to Bristol. It took less than an hour to pack their few belongings. And with sad hearts, on May 25, 1832, the Mueller's boarded a stagecoach for Bristol. George was now 26 years old. As the stage rumbled along, he wondered what challenges lay ahead. <clears throat> At first, everything went smoothly. The Mueller's and Henry Craig found a modest home with five bedrooms and two sitting rooms where they could live together. A rich Christian man had rented a second chapel called Bethesda Chapel and the two men divided services between it and Gideon Chapel. Meanwhile, Mary remained in good health with the baby due at the end of September. <clears throat> it was the church bells, though, that first alerted George to the looming disaster in the city. The bells tolled after a funeral. At the beginning of June, they began to toll almost nonstop. A cholera epidemic had descended on Bristol. In 19th century England, major differences existed between a city and a village. In villages, people lived in their own cottages or in small groups of row houses. They drank water from their own wells and got rid of their bathroom waste and their gardens. In the cities, Bristol included, things were much different. People lived in long rows of brick houses that snaked for miles without a single tree or field in sight. Dirty water and sewage overflowed from open drains that ran alongside the streets and the water that was piped into houses was untreated and often carried germs and bacteria from polluted streams. These differences made conditions ripe for cholera. The disease spread into that city and no disease was more feared than cholera was. It spread like wildfire, killing thousands of people. George and Henry were called out at all hours of the day and night to pray for those who had been stricken with the disease. Those who caught it usually died quickly. Often it took only 12 hours from the time a person first began to feel sick and started vomiting to the time he or she was laid in a coffin, that is, if a coffin could be found. The work was exhausting and it seemed like it would never end. All through July and August, bodies piled up on the sidewalks, waiting for carts to carry them away. Often they lay there rotting for a week or two because the cart driver himself had died of the disease and it was hard to find someone brave enough to replace him. Everyone knew the best chance for staying healthy was to keep away from other people, especially large groups of people, when the disease would spread quickly. <clears throat> However, the folks at the two chapels wanted to continue meeting together to comfort and encourage one another. So George and Henry agreed with them, and they held a prayer meeting every morning to ask God to spare them and stop the epidemic. Often two or three hundred people would ignore the risks of meeting together and show up to be led in prayer by George or Henry. Even though the people prayed earnestly, the church bells in the city continued to toll. <clears throat> it was hard for George as he trudged from one end of Bristol to another. 
The young pastor was welcomed into any house he stopped at. Even total strangers reached out to grab him as he walked by. George would read the Bible aloud to them and pray for the dying, or he would comfort a hysterical widow who now had no way to feed her ragged, hollow-cheeked children. Mary Mueller was fighting her own battle. Every morning she watched her husband walk out the door and into danger. Each time George reached out to hold the hand of a dying child or help a woman lay her husband's dead body out or hug a little child, he was exposing himself to cholera. What if you get sick, she asked him. Have you thought of that? George nodded silently. Of course he had thought of it a thousand times. Every meal could easily be his last, especially given the number of people he touched who were dying. But I have to do it, Mary. Somebody has to help these people and let them know God cares. But what about me, Mary pleaded. Does that God care about me and our little one? There's nothing to guarantee you will even be alive to see it born. She wiped away the tears with the corner of her apron. I know, I know, he said soothingly. But Mary, you cannot imagine me hiding inside my own house while there are people who need God's comfort and the little I can do for them, can you? She shook her head. No, she agreed quietly. That would not be the man I married. On September 16th, George did stay home all day to assist the midwife with the birth of the baby daughter, Lydia. In spite of all the death around them, Lydia was a thriving, healthy baby. By the time she was a month old, the cholera epidemic had finally run its course. A huge service of Thanksgiving was held at the Gideon Chapel. Of the 200 people who regularly attended the two chapels, only two, only one had died. January 4th, 1833 brought with it a blessing and a mystery. That morning, George had collected the mail and noticed a letter postmarked from Baghdad. When he slit the envelope open, a check for 200 pounds fell out, and George quickly scanned the letter that came with it for some clue as to what the money was for. No one could have been more surprised than George when he read the money was for him and his family and Henry Craig to move to Baghdad to be missionaries there. The letter writer promised more money would follow when they arrived. <clears throat> Excitement stirred inside George. Was this the opportunity he'd been waiting for? As, as after became a no, let me start this over. Was this the opportunity he had been waiting for since becoming a Christian? Had all his time in England been training to prepare him to go and tell the lost souls in other lands about God? He hoped so. His brother-in-law, Anthony Groves, wrote regularly from Persia, and the life of a foreign missionary sounded so much more adventurous than that of a pastor, making endless house calls and drinking bottomless cups of tea. <clears throat> George hurried off to tell Henry Craig about the letter. Henry, too, was excited. The two of them talked about it all morning, and by lunchtime, they had all but convinced themselves they should both go to Baghdad. After lunch, George promised to write a member, visit a member of the congregation, a cobbler who lived about two miles away in the poorest part of Bristol. It had rained the night before, and as he made his way, George had to jump over mud puddles, and every carriage that went by sprayed water on him. George had just passed the bakery on Newfoundland, Newfoundland Street when a little girl came up to him. She was no more than five years old, and she was piggybacking a toddler, a small boy with a runny nose wearing only a torn pair of trousers. Please, mister, the little girl said with a lisp, could you spare us a shilling? My ma's gone with the cholera and my dad went to the mines and didn't come back. George stopped and crouched beside the little girl. What's your name, dear, he asked, thinking of his own daughter tucked in her warm crib. Emily, she replied, and I could spell it too. My mom taught me. Her eyes shone with delight with her dirt streaked face. Can you now, smiled George. Well, tell you what, you spell it correctly and you will have earned your shilling. E-M-I-L-Y, she said triumphantly as she stuck out her grubby hand. George laughed. Perfect, he said, reaching into his pocket. Here's your shilling and God bless you, Emily. As Emily hitched her brother up higher on her back and picked her way through the crowd, George felt strangely saddened. He had seen little girls and boys like Emily every day in the six months he lived in Bristol but none of them had affected him like this. Where was Emily going? Did she have anywhere to sleep at night? Was a kind adult watching over her, or was she at the mercy of some evil person? What would happen to her brother if she got sick, or where would she go for help if she got ill? These questions haunted him as he walked alone, and he wondered why he had not seen it before. He didn't need to go to the mission field in Baghdad or anywhere else for that matter. He was standing in the middle of the mission field. 
Surely there could be no more needy people in all the world than little children like Emily and her brother. Baghdad might sound foreign and exciting with its colorful bazaars and camels and pipe music, but there was work to be done in dirty, overcrowded Bristol. George did not know how to go about it or what a lone person with no regular income could do, but he knew one thing. With God's help, he could do something to help the poor homeless children of Bristol. Yes, he said to himself aloud as he quickened his pace, God has given me a mission field right here, and I will live and die in it. <laughs> so what do we find is the uh, kind of interesting point of that chapter as you were listening? I think he's going to take a gig. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to take more than that one, I'll tell you. Uh, did he start an orphanage? He started several. started several orphanages. <laughs> Let me see. If, if it's the same one I'm thinking about, he prayed every day, and every need was met to feed them kids. Right on time. Okay, that's right. Really. That's what I said. You guys will love hearing this because it builds your faith. You know, if God would do this for this man, who was just just one person who just wanted to make a difference where he was, then he can do that with us right here where we are. And that's interesting, you know, that it ended in that regard that particular chapter with uh, him coming to a realization that, hey, I can do God's work right here where I am. And it's almost as if that had never dawned on him. The, 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 I guess the general consensus back in the day was that I have to go to some heathen land, some foreign land to become a mission, to technically be a missionary. But what, what is every Christian, really? I mean, every Christian is really a missionary. And... and Typically, every I mean, no person is living by themselves as a hermit on an island. They're they're all living around other people, and uh, it's of course the gospel message is for everybody. So, uh, but no but that not missionaries think you got to go somewhere else to be a missionary instead yeah. of being right here. You know? Right. Um, what's the saying? You know, I mean. <clears throat> when you're when you're close around friends and, and loved ones, it seems like they more than anybody else would take your uh, your work for granted. You know what I mean? Jesus said that. Jesus said the apostle wouldn't even accept in his own home. Right, yeah. because they're they're too close oh, together. Yeah. So the idea of going somewhere else uh, well, seems to be appealing. And that did happen to George because he was from Prussia, right. which was I guess German. And because of England, he was going to a foreign country. Sure, sure. Luckily, in Floyd, no one really knows us, so this is a good thing. Well, no, I don't think so. I think there are plenty of people that know us around here. We may not realize it, but there are lots of people. There are lots of people that know us. But anyway, the point is that we have an opportunity to influence people all around us all the time. And if we keep in mind that we're always really a missionary for God, no matter no matter when and how, then uh, <clears throat> that makes a big difference. Mom had a poem that said, I am my neighbor's Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's true. Yeah. Because she said that the only thing they might ever see about Jesus is what they see within you. That's right. That's right. Same thing in the home. The biggest thing that bothers me is these little kids that they show on TV, you know, starving with the hair lift and, uh, and uh, raggedy clothes. Well, yeah, it's probably the same pictures they took 50 years ago or longer, but yeah. Uh, I, that bothers me more than anything to see them kids, especially the ones at St. Jude's Hospital. And, uh, it's designed to tug at your heartstring for sure. Well, buddy, they sure do. Yeah. You know, they take them kids. That really bothers me. All right, so this month uh, we're, our focus is on trust. You know, if you um, transitioning over to our <coughs> study time, if, if there was a word that uh, we could set out there as the word uh, necessary for God's people at the end of time, it would have to be that word, okay? trust, right? Yeah. Trust. 
Um, right now, <clears throat> right now it's easy, uh, relatively easy, to say that we trust the Lord, isn't it? It's relatively easy to say that because we don't have people throwing things at the house or shooting the windows out. Uh, we don't have to board things up <clears throat> uh, because of relative ease uh, in society. But as we get closer to the end of probationary time, what's going to be the circumstances that we will be living under? It's going to be worse than what it is now. I it's mean, going to be like. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be like a war zone. Okay? And I know people people kind of sometimes question that. But when you look in Scripture, that's exactly where the Scriptures take us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> the dragon was wroth. Mm -hmm. You know, that word wroth is kind of like, it means enraged. It means, uh, like a, if you could picture like a, a, a mad dog, you know, barking and foaming at the mouth. Uh, snarling, wanting to tear something apart, whatever it can find. And uh, so, so Satan recognizes that his time is running short. <clears throat> he has no choice. He has no choice but to go after um, the righteous, to try to, try to turn them. Okay? Now, God is going to allow that to happen, right? Because by that point in time, we have grown in our ability. We have grown in our understanding of what it means to trust. Right? What it means to trust. <clears throat> um, we want to go through, uh, again, we're focusing on Gethsemane, so we want to tie these two together because Gethsemane was the place where that was, that was uh, the forum <clears throat> that God was going to use to develop uh, this kind of trust in the Son of Man. Okay. Now, how many of you? How many of you think that when Jesus was growing up, that uh, at age ten, for example, he had the trust that he needed to go through the seminary? Mm -hmm. Anybody think that? Yeah. Okay, how about age fifteen? Mm -hmm. Age twenty? You know, did he have the trust that would would take him through a seminary experience? Yeah, what do you I think? think he was building that trust. Okay, well, that's, he was he was developing it. He was growing. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that you know Christ as the man was growing in grace, just like we are growing in grace. Uh, every day, of course, the primary thing in his day was that relationship, that connection with his father, right? Well, he come to live as a man, just like we live as a man. Okay, that makes us. I mean, that, that helps us try to grow, you know, in trust, too. Yeah, it, it's... Because we knew he did. His example was important to us. Right? Mm -hmm. And so as we study his example, we should apply the same principles to our thinking, to our lives, so that the result is the same, okay? Mm -hmm. Because uh, and as you go through Scripture, it's just interesting to watch some of the people that God called for special things and how they had to develop that same kind of trust that we're talking about. Now, what we want to do, uh, what we typically do this, uh, <clears throat> this month, we want to break down the Gethsemane's trust into four different areas. And we're going to see these in uh, as we go through Scripture, as we go turn to our Scriptures in a minute here. But... I think you'll see these. <clears throat> This is really, when we get to our scripture, what we're going to see. We're going to see trust in prayer, trust in perseverance, trust in possibilities, and trust in power. Okay? Here are the four things that we'll be kind of considering this month uh, when I'm here. 
leading out in the studies. The first scripture I want one of us to turn to is in the psalm. Psalm 18, verse 2, is our key text that we're going to be looking at, <clears throat> our, our theme text, if you will. Psalm 18. one there, chapter 18 of Psalms. It says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And in verse 2, our theme, the Lord is my rock, <coughs> fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Now, does that sound like the circumstance that we're in today? <laughs> Amen. Um, do we need, does it seem like at this moment in history that we need this kind of protection? I mean, I can go out right now. I, I, yeah, I mean, some of you drove over here in your cars. You got, you just left your house this morning. You got in your car, you drove down the highway, and you came over here. And you didn't have to go through any locked gates or, or uh, iron fences or anything to, to get over. You didn't have to go through military checkpoints. Uh, you know, some parts of the world, that's routine. You know, you go to Israel or other places like that, you've got military checkpoints at various places. Uh, you've got people walking around with guns strapped over their shoulders. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good. But at any rate, I'm just saying that it doesn't seem at this point like we are at that place yet where, where God has to be. We have to trust Him so much. He's, uh, I mean, these terms are, are warfare terms. You know, he's my fortress, my deliverer, my strength. He's my stronghold, etc. Now, there's going to come a time, there's going to come a time uh, for us, particularly uh, as we move toward the close of probationary time, Satan recognizes that <clears throat> he has to gain access to us in some way. And so he'll start using co-workers, neighbors, friends, anybody that he can to, to bring an assault upon us, okay? So that, so that what we're gonna, what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up uh, feeling very much alone, very much isolated, uh, very much like, like we're being targeted, and that's because we are, right? And we have to understand that, that we are going to be targeted for eliminate, elimination, right? Elimination. Right. We have to recognize that Satan's that the main objective for Satan is to perpetuate his own existence. The only way he can do that is to eliminate true believers. It's, not, it's his only option, you see. He, he's worked all through history to trying to deceive, trying to distort the truth, trying to deceive people, to, to move people voluntarily, to have people themselves, basically move themselves out of harmony with God's word, word and God's will. And many have done that, right? Have, hasn't, hasn't many people gone down the broad road? Where, and that broad road leads to destruction. destruction, right? But if you make a commitment to stay on the straight and narrow path, I will guarantee you that he's going he's gonna to sit there and he's going to have people on both sides of that path taking pot shots at you because you've set yourself up to be a target because of your commitment. Okay? So this text is going to mean a lot more to us at some point in the near future, but trust is not trust is not like a light switch that you just go and flick it on. Trust is something that has to develop, right? It has to develop. Now, what we want to do is we want to go. Yeah, we need development. That's what we want to look at. That's what we want to consider. That's the that's the key thing. We want to make sure we don't miss the elements necessary to to develop that kind of trust that we're going to need. And the best place to go is to go to Gethsemane. Well, we know that we have that kind of trust. <laughs> I, I think that we better know it. I think that we better know that we're following, the, 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 uh, that we're on the right path. But again, okay. too, Christ, even when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed three times, Father, take this cup from me. It's not that he didn't trust. It's just that he couldn't see the end from the beginning as the man Christ. 
Well, as we go through this, let's well, he do this. Is that as a man. I mean, just like we do. Yeah, so we're going to have to go through these things in order to, to accomplish that. You're not going to get that trust unless you have adversity. Sure enough. Adversity brings trust. <clears throat> it should. It should. And, and, and with those who have made a commitment and are convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit, then, yeah, it's going to work that way. Okay. Um, we may not have it at the beginning or at the start, but we will start developing it. Right. Um, actually, before, well, what word have you got there? But, and it says, my buckler. Buckler? Well, yeah, you're in. Uh, is that what you? Is that what you're saying? Which which what, what verse does that you, mean? What verse are you looking at? One that's in uh, Psalm, oh, 18, Psalm, Psalm two eighteen. Psalm 18 too. Yeah, a buckler being a shield. I have the word shield there. A shield. A shield. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just couldn't put it in there. Yeah, something that protects. It should be in the middle. It should be down <clears> to <throat> the center of your Bible. Bible should tell you what it means. Oh. Let me just share with you, um, you know, because oh, that you don't have some of you haven't been okay. to uh, Israel, and I've had the opportunity to, to go to Israel, and of course to go to Gethsemane uh, and the Garden Tomb. But one of the things that you'll find in Gethsemane, you'll find these huge olive trees, okay? And an olive tree, it's, it's interesting, an olive, this was kind of the perfect place for Christ to have gone, because an olive tree... Um, <clears throat> these olive trees here are about 2,000 years in existence or over. And so some of these very same olive trees could have been, there's a, there's a kind of a section uh, in that area there, uh, a section where you have these old uh, olive trees that, that date back all the way to the time of Christ. And they date back 2,000 years. Yeah. Now, the olive trees, what's interesting about olive trees is that they... They only, uh, they have a lifespan, you know, like anything else in nature, it has a lifespan. Mm -hmm. And an olive tree has a lifespan of about 500 years. That's, that's pretty old. I mean, that's, 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 you know, five centuries, that's incredible. That's pretty old for any tree. And so your, your immediate question should be, well, if they have a lifespan of 500 years, then what, is this just a miracle that's taking place here, or what's the deal? You know, why, how can these trees be... Um, 2,000 years in existence. How can, how can these trees date back to the time of Christ? The water with the blood of Jesus himself. I don't imagine <laughs> the tree's going to be around a while. <laughs> uh, let's see, I don't have a picture right here. What happens, if you look really close at this picture here, and I know you can't see it on the film, but you'll, you'll see this, how this, the, the uh, trunks have gotten really gnarly and other shoots have, have come out. What happens with olive trees is that they'll grow and they'll they'll produce and so forth. But before they they uh, they die off, the the original tree will send out a shoot, right? A new a new a new branch, a new shoot, whatever. That's why they're so gnarly looking because after that happens four or five six times, you got uh, you know, a little shoot coming out here, and then that grows into a kind of a tree, and then a little shoot will come out of that, and that'll grow into a tree. But you have this, about every 500 years, you have this, uh, this tree actually perpetuating itself. Life just continuing on with another shoot out from the original tree. But then the original tree dies, right? It kind of just remains there. And then the other tree starts to grow. So you get these really gnarly, crazy looking kind of trees. And some of them are, are just uh, amazing to look at. But the tree perpetuates itself the life continues to grow, and basically, in another tree. I mean, it'd be like, <clears throat> be like if uh, you know we live to be a hundred years old, but before we, we pass on, you know, something else shoots out of us and starts to develop into another person. <laughs> you know, how crazy that would be, right? Crazy, and then the you know, then the old person dies off, and the new person takes life. It'd be kind of crazy, wouldn't it? But that's really what happens with olive trees. You know, so some of them, some of them grow to be. You know, <clears throat> Um, quite, quite, uh, quite old. And also, you have there a um, a rock, a section of rocks where supposedly 
you know, Jesus, when he was in Gethsemane, um, <clears throat> going through that Passion Weekend, he supposedly, you know, propped himself up on some of these rocks and he, he prayed there at that, at that rock. Well, of course, they, they put a shrine or a church over that. And uh, uh, we don't know, there's no way to know for certain whether or not that is the actual place where uh, <clears throat> where he did. But obviously it's in that area, in that same area there at Gethsemane. That's the same Gethsemane that existed during the time of Christ that we find there today if you go and, and, and visit. And it's kind of a neat place to walk around. If you ever go to Israel, you definitely would want to go there. Did you go in the tomb over there? In, which tomb? Okay. The garden tomb? Yeah. Yeah, you can go You can go into the garden tomb here. This is this is the tomb here. Of course, it's down there, too, on the picture. Uh, you can go into that. Uh, that's in the garden tomb area, which is a different location than Gethsemane. Okay, uh, basically what you have, oh, yeah. but is it the real tomb? The one that it is the original tomb. Buried in. That's correct, it is. It is. It is the original tomb. What you have is, uh, uh, Jerusalem is a uh, city of three mountains, basically, Zion, Moriah, and Mount of Olives. And you've got the Temple Mount here on this mountain area. Then you have a valley running down through here called the Kidron Valley. And then the Mount of Olives begins over here, and Gethsemane is over here going up the mountain. Okay, Gethsemane is all this mountain area going up, uh, <clears throat> up on what's called uh, the Mount of Olives. Okay. But you got this Kidron Valley going down here, and then you have the, the city of Jerusalem over here. This would be the Temple Mount to give you an idea how, uh, how that's laid out. So when Christ wanted some time away from the hustle and bustle of city life, so to speak, or urban life in the crowds, they would find their way over to the, to the you know, Mount of Olives, basically on the slopes of there, you had the groves of olive trees, and they would go in there and they would find a place to rest and relax and just kind of kick back. What is that, about a mile of steel or something? Uh, I wouldn't even say it's that. I mean, I would say maybe more or less, uh, maybe, maybe not even half a mile. From, from here to here, probably maybe just a half a mile, maybe. I mean, <clears throat> so it'd be a day's journey, Sabbath day's journey. Uh, yeah, yeah, it could be. Definitely be a place to come and relax. But I mean, that's not that's not what's going to happen here. Uh, open your Bibles to Matthew twenty-six. <clears throat> you have some commentary in the Book of Mark, but mostly Matthew twenty-six. You have the plot to kill Jesus, the anointing at Bethany. Uh, Jesus celebrates, of course, the Passover with his disciples. What works? He institutes the Lord's Supper. I'm just kind of looking at the highlights down through the chapter. But it's not until we come down to verse 36. <clears throat> now, it's interesting, too, that before that, uh, the commentary in Matthew here is, talks about Christ predicting Peter's denial. Right? Now remember, Jesus is trying to get these guys that have been with him for three plus years, he's trying to get them to the place where they will trust. They'll trust in what's happening, you see? That's all right. They'll, they'll trust in what's happening, okay? He's trying to get them to that place. And... Uh, Jesus says to them in verse 31, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. All right? So you can imagine if you were back there and you were one of them, and you know, you'd know gone through the Passover meal, etc. And of course, Jesus is trying to get them to realize, hey, this is all pointing to me. You know, I'm the Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. They don't really want to believe that. I mean, God, Christ has told them, even on, on more than one occasion, he's told them, I'm going to die, I'm going to be killed, um, you know, etc. <clears throat> and in three days I'm going to be raised, etc. I mean, he's, t he's told them this information to try to get them ready for the event. But as you can imagine, they have been trained all their lives to understand what? What have they been taught concerning the Messiah? That he's going to be a ruling king. He's going to be a ruling king. What did you say? I said that he would be a conqueror. Yeah, he'd be, he's going to come, and they're under Roman oppression, so the Messiah, in their minds, is going to come, set them free from a Roman yoke, establish his earthly kingdom, 
they're going to be, you know, the the the, uh, <clears throat> the authorities in the kingdom, the ones sitting on his left and right, so forth. They didn't even expect him to come as a baby. They just expect him to appear, poof, right, and he'd be a ruling king. They'd come in and wipe out the Romans. Sure, and along the way, as you read through some of the other aspects of Scripture, uh, you f you see them hinting at, hey, is, is this the time where Jesus asserts his authority? Is this where he takes over the throne? And it seems like even in opportune times for him to do that, what does he do? Tell the people to go away and, and, and let's go over here. Mm -hmm. So he, he really thwarts their motives in wanting to, uh, you know, set up an earthly kingdom. And what does Jesus keep telling them? My kingdom is not, not this of world. this world. Okay, he keeps telling them that. But again, you can see how uh, if you've been trained certain things, if, if you've grown up being taught a certain thing, how that tradition kind of gets a hold of you and it sets in. And even with, here's the son of, of, of man, here's Jesus himself, trying to move you away from that and you're resisting. And so there's some was some resistance there in even thinking about the possibility of, of him laying down his life. I mean to them that would be that's defeat. Well, we're not you know we are looking for victory here, not defeat. Right? Well when he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, <clears throat> that was the sign that he was the rolling king. Everybody accepted that. They knew he was going to be the rolling king when he was on that donkey. That's how they interpreted it. Yeah, that's exactly how they saw it. Yeah, yeah. But, but three right. days later, the very same ones that said, put that sucker to death. Yeah. But he's not riding in as king. He's riding in as priest. He's riding in as the offerer and the offering. And the conqueror. Right, yeah. Okay, so Jesus is telling them, look, all of you guys are going to stumble because of me tonight. And uh, he says here, he quotes, uh, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will scatter. Wow. <laughs> if you could imagine yourself hearing that, you're thinking one thing, but here's Jesus telling you, the shepherd is going to be struck, and the, and the sheep are going to scatter. I mean, that doesn't sound very positive, does it? That's not a positive sentiment. But they were willing, uh, because of all the things that they had seen and, and all the the uh, teachings and instruction they had, they were willing to just cast off these anomalies as, what's he talking about? We really don't understand what, he, what, he, what he's what, trying to get to. Wait a minute. Uh, now, here for three and a half years, they saw all the miracles that he performed. There's no question, they, they, there's no question in their mind as to actually who he was. They knew he was the Messiah. Then how could they at this point not see it? I mean, even after he tells them. They don't understand the plan. You know, God has orchestrated a plan. You know, we call it the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption. God orchestrated it before the world was even created. They have bought into certain interpretations that actually are erroneous to describe the plan that God has put in place. And so, it's because they don't understand the plan, okay? And I, and I can say the same thing about modern-day Christianity. Modern-day Christianity really doesn't have a firm grasp of the plan of salvation, okay? They think they do because they've embraced half of the, the covenant component, but they only, they only, they're only grabbing half of it, not the whole thing, okay? The disciples are having the same thing all the time. Yeah, so you can go down into any Baptist church you want to. It's the same preaching every week. Just about like going to a Catholic church and they go through the rosary every week. It's really the same thing. I mean, it's, uh, they just say the same thing. They don't use the rest of the Bible. Yeah. This, this striking the shepherd, right? If you notice the next verse, the striking the shepherd here, is uh, striking the shepherd down. Okay? Striking the shepherd was, was taking the shepherd out. Okay? Striking him down. Because look at verse 32. But after I have what? Raised. Been raised, right? I will go before you to Galilee. So again, Jesus is trying to really prepare them for what is about to happen. Okay? He's trying to prepare them. Peter answered and said to him, 
<laughs> Here, and this is Peter, right? Yeah. Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made now, to I stumble. Now, listen, when Peter said that, he meant it with all his heart. He believed it with all his heart. Mm -hmm. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right. I'll stick you with you. No. He even proved it when he drew the sword and tried to cut that rascal's head off. And, and is that because he trusted in his Messiah? He trusted in his rabbi? No. It was because he trusted in himself okay. by saying, hey, <laughs> I will not. There's nothing that can separate us. Okay. And so that, it, it, we're, we're starting to understand there, there's, there's something about trust, this kind of trust, that is, uh, goes, goes beyond our, our own ability, our own uh, trusting in ourselves. In fact, to trust in ourselves will leave us vulnerable, right? As it did in this. As it did here. So Peter is boisterous Peter. You know, I will never stumble because, you know, etc., etc. And Jesus said to him, assuredly. <laughs> you know, I, I bet he looked him right straight in the eye and he said, absolutely, definitely, you don't, you know, you don't know what you're saying. I don't think he you know, denied him uh, uh, as a way uh, he felt, felt like he, he was going to do, you know, or he didn't understand that part. Well, you notice how specific, look how specific Jesus gets in his reply. Assuredly. To assuredly, Peter. to Peter, yeah, assuredly I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, which would mean you're getting ready to dawn for the next day, right? <clears throat> you will deny me three times. Mm -hmm. That's even me and me. Well, you'll deny me three times. Peter, of course, you know, being again boisterous Peter, self confident Peter, self confident, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. He believed that. <laughs> and, and then look, and so said all the disciples. Yeah. So Peter basically now is setting up everybody. He's setting up everybody to take a major fall. He wasn't looking for them to, to do what they come to do. Yeah. Let me see if I can find real fast that... Um, there's a quotation in the book Desire of Ages. You know, but now listen, we're no different than we're no different than uh, than than Peter was. We sit here and we say right now, I will not, I will not turn against the Sabbath. I will not. But yet, unless we build up the faith and the trust, we will. You're going to have to have something to stand on, or you're not going to stand at all. Well, I hope that closes. Uh, I'm keeping the Sabbath and, and doing my best to keep the Ten Commandments. Whenever God closes probation, I want to be on the side that uh, I get that help from, because you'll be the same from then on. Uh, there's a uh, quotation here where she's talking about this situation here. And uh, I'll have to see if I can find it later. Uh, it's either in chapter 73, I think, or maybe before. Um, but basically what it says uh, is that um, <clears throat> the, the events that transpired in, in the Garden of Gethsemane and, of course, uh, that, that weekend so took the disciples by surprise it was as if Christ had never forewarned them. Yeah. In other words, he was telling them all along, this is going to happen, this is the plan, this was what needs to happen. And yet they were just blocking that out of their thinking because they were so programmed to think that the Messiah is coming, he's going to set us free from the Roman yoke, and we're going to rise victorious, and we're going to have a, a, a king, an earthly kingdom of peace and prosperity, and all this and that. And so that was their expectation. And when Christ would interject these other things, like I'm going to be struck down, and I'm going to be, you know, crucified, etc., they were like, I, I, don't, I don't want to hear that. that. You're talking about something else there. But they want him as king to set it up and get rid of the Romans. Right. But but when it did play out the way that it had to. 
They were devastated. The disciples were devastated. I don't think they understood, you know, what I uh, mean, that they would be resurrected and, and to heaven and back. Yeah, know? I mean, they truly experienced hope, their hope, right? I mean, they were they were living the reality of their hope there with the, that, that communion, and they were crushed. I mean, they were crushed. Yeah, they were, the heart was destroyed. They were very poor. Now, we are going to we're going to go through a similar experience that Jesus went through in Gethsemane. Um, we have to recognize that that the same scenario is going to play out. Okay? We we have uh, uh, an expectation of how things are going to go. We don't know every detail. God is sparing us from every detail because of how devastating it would be. But we also are going to come to the place where our situation seems hopeless. Okay? They pass that law. We're going to have to be a right. We, we need to know. Carry us down the jail. We need to know ahead of time that that our scenario is going. Uh, that God is going to allow things to take place. He's going to allow circumstances to develop to bring us to the very core, I mean, to the very edge as well. We're going to be tempted. Very, it's going to be very easy to be tempted that uh, that uh, God has forsaken us. He has cast us off, uh, you know, to the to, to the to, to be a, an appetizer for the dragon, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and hopelessness. Could well up in our own hearts and minds. Wait a minute. Now, how, are, are, wait a minute now. Go ahead. Keep going. Are we being shown things today that we are overlooking or rejecting, like the apostles did? That we 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 see things. We are so tunnel visioned that we see things exactly this way. That we can't see these other things. He warned them. He warned them. Is he warning us? Is he telling us? Are we overlooking things that we should we should be, be not zeroing in on? I think we are and will be in, in the exact same scenario, maybe even worse than what the disciples were right here. So many people. What does Corinthians? What does Paul say in Corinthians? Right? Second uh, Second Thessalonians. We are children of the. Light. light, not of darkness. Okay, we have insight, we have understanding as to, to not only what happened in the past, after you know, after Jesus was crucified and resurrected and everything, then that's when they really hit them. You know, it wasn't well because you know where did they end up? Where did they end up? One of them the did the way they was uh, uh, crucified, upside down and uh, in prison and everything. Yeah, but where were they during that weekend? Where did they end up, the disciples? They were gone with the except they scattered. They scattered. They scattered. See with other scattered. They scattered, right? <laughs> Just like the like cut had to be prophesied. They, shepherd was struck down. The sheep scattered. Okay, where did they end up? During the during that weekend, crucifixion week, right they, up, right? they end up in the upper room, and they had the door bolted shut for what? Fear, fear, fear. for fear. And then Jesus appeared. They thought they were next. That's whenever they begin to get the. They thought they were next. the right. We will end up. Listen, God's people at the end are going to flee to the mountains and to the to the forest. They're, what are we fleeing from? What, why are we fleeing? Aren't because we the ones the, that are going to be victorious? Yeah, but it's because oh, of the oh, anger oh, of the people out here that are trying to kill us. Because we're the, they think we're the ones bringing knowledge stuff on them when it's actually themselves. Can, can you can there be fear and trust at the same time? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm just saying I'm not trying to paint a picture of, of the reality of what God is going to allow to take place. Just like what, just like you're what not he won't be afraid. Yeah, just like what he allowed here. Yeah, that's what trust is ultimately tested though, is when there's fear. Absolutely. Well, it, it, see, it's easy it, right now, right? It's easy what, to sit here. What it is, even it, it's 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 your actions, regardless of the fear you may have, is what counts. You might be afraid, yeah. but are you still even even being afraid? Are you still going to stand up for the Lord? If you do, then okay, that's trust. 
Yeah, that's faith. Yes. That's, a, that's a great definition. I, I heard a professor of Caribbean Union College one time say, you know, if a, if a man goes into battle, and he, and he uh, dis, despite the, the intensity of the battle, he goes out and he, he acts heroically instead of cowardly, right? We call that bravery, right? And so for the Christian, if the Christian acts despite any doubt, any fear, that's really true faith. Let me tell you, true faith, right? let me tell you, you, a man that receives the Medal of Honor, the highest award you get, you ask him and talk to him and he'll tell you he was the scariest man there. Right. The only reason he fought so hard is because he was the scariest. He acted, he, yeah. he acted despite yeah. the fear. Yeah, he acted regardless of what the fear may have been. Well, he can be scared and still that's what makes him have the faith. His the actions. Reasons. Okay, let's go back and to then. let's go back to uh, Matthew here. All right, so Jesus is telling his disciples right up front, um, "You're going to be afraid. You're going to be scattered. You're going to deny me, etc." And of course, their their response is, no, no, no way, way. Yeah. no way, not me. not me, okay? All right, so then the reality comes on. Now, now here comes Jesus, verse 36. They, they decide to go uh, to the place called Gethsemane. They said to the disciples, uh, Jesus is saying this, he said, sit here while I go and pray over there. Which, uh, what, did, what does Christ demonstrating here? Trust in what? Trust in prayer, okay? Yeah. Now he's he always prayed, he went and prayed the same prayer three times. He did, didn't he? Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and of course James and John. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now this isn't this isn't the normal scenario that usually plays out in the Garden of Gethsemane. Normally this is a place of relaxation, a place where they're gonna go and they're gonna get away from the the, the, just the, the labor of the day, and they're going to regenerate mind and body, okay? But that's not what ha what's happening on, in this particular situation here. Now, uh, right here, right here is exactly where Christ had fear. He didn't want, he knew, he knew what was going to happen. And it says here that, that he, be, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed, but yet even with the fear and and the dread of having to go through this, he still said, "Father, not my will, but Your will." Which what is his expectation? Right, right from Scripture here, we see what Christ's expectation is as he begins to go through this. Uh, and, and what is he actually well, going through? Well, remember now, remember now, remember now. Why is he deeply distressed? Well, number one, well, now, he doesn't okay. understand. Well, no, no, listen now, 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 this is what he thought. This is the man part of Christ that thought this, okay? He knew when he died on the cross of Calvary, he was dead for eternity. He was taking every man's sin upon him. He was going to be separated from, from the Father forever. He was dying for eternity. That's what he thought right here, right now. He couldn't see through the portals of the grave. When he died, he knew he was dying what for else? eternity. What else? What do you think, Ken? Uh, that, well, I mean, it's... Uh... I mean, it's hard for me to explain, you know, but... Uh, we'll take a stab at it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, was, he had to he, not be able to see exactly how the Father was going to resurrect him. Right. Because he was so sorrowful and he kept wanting him to take the cup from him, but... He said, not my will, but thy will be done. And, uh, and he done this three times because he hadn't seen it. I, did Jesus know at that time where the Ark of the Covenant was? I don't believe he so. He didn't know where they was going to uh, take him and crucify him. Yeah. I don't believe he did know. Well, I don't believe he did know him as, as a man. He probably didn't, but whenever uh, they carried him and put him on the cross, that's where he couldn't see how this was going to play out. Notice this from Desire of Ages. It says, uh, 
will be sent help. Why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. That's, that was something he was really bothered. Notice this. It says, throughout his life on earth, he had walked in the light of God's presence. Now, that, that may be a little bit di difficult for us to ascertain and to understand completely. Um, to be walking constantly in God's presence. Um, of course, he, he had developed, as he grew up from a child, he, de he developed that he was developing that trust relationship day by day, right? He was praying to his father. All the miracles that he had performed, were they performed by him? No. I, I think, they were performed through him, right? Right. By the power of God. God turned his back. Because of the sin that he was taking on. He okay, did. there you go. And, and there you go. Uh, he, Jesus couldn't see this. It says here that, uh, it says, when in conflict with men who were inspired by the very spirit of Satan, Christ could say, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Okay? So he and the Father, you, you find in John, particularly the Gospel of John, Jesus would always say, You know, the Father and I are. One. We're one. We're one. He tells Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen, you've the, seen Father. the Father. Okay? So, I mean, they, they were they were uh, walking in harmony in one spirit, one purpose, right? One desire, right? All that. But, um, but now, as he's going into Gethsemane there, he seems to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Wow. Okay? God is, like you said, God is looking away because why? Because Christ oh, is becoming, becoming Christ is becoming sin for us. Okay? Right. He's becoming. He's he started the process of becoming the substitute. Is start starting to take place right right here in Gethsemane. Okay, and because of the closeness that he had with the Father, any little bit of of uh, alteration in that closeness is going to be dramatically felt, right? It's going to be dramatically felt. This is the guilt of fallen humanity he must bear. It says, now he must be numbered with the transgressors. Upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Okay, forever. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God's <clears throat> the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, and this is the, actually the next verse that we didn't read yet. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto okay. death. Okay. Christ senses. He realizes that sin is the weight of sin is going to just crush the life out of him. Okay, and so that that's why he is praying, Father, you know, take this cup from me. You know, I, I don't want I don't want to drink this cup if it means me separating from you for all eternity, right? I mean, that's that's in your in a, in his humanness. That's definitely a very uh, logical, sensible plea in his sure. humanness, right? <clears throat> so he says, you know, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And, he's, and then he turns to the three, right? Stay here and watch with me. Basically, stay what here mean, and okay. pray with me, right? I mean... <clears throat> We can't, we can't even imagine he wanted support. Like. He's looking for support. Of course, what any person Saying, you know, going through distress is news. going to want is they're going to want some kind of support. In it's fact, separate. just just be here with me. You know, just be here and watch. They go to sleep. There, there's nothing that they can do, right? right. There's nothing right. that they can do to take this. They can't say to Jesus, "Give me some of that burden." You know, let me let me take it on. What would it have done to them? Would have killed them. Right just like that, would kill them, right? Okay. So he can't he can't even let them share in that. He knows that he must tread the wine press alone, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so he's going through all this now. As Kenny, as you brought out, he does specifically pray three times. 
Now, when we look at these, and we'll look at them in just a second, but do you see any correlation to the three sections of the sanctuary with him praying three times? Do we see any correlation with him taking three disciples uh, with him to go through this, 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 so that they can see this experience firsthand? I'm going to stop any you important stuff says the inner circle. Well, these are the three, of course, that he is the closest to. There's no yeah, question. Sure. Peter, James, and John. They're with him all the time. Peter, James, and John. Uh, James and John is the son of this. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so if you're going to persevere, right, if you're going to trust in perseverance, mm -hmm. what Jesus knows is that here are his three closest earthly companions. Is he saying to them, I, I can trust in you guys. I can trust you guys. I can trust you guys to go through this. I think they were the first three. Or the first three uh, disciples. Right. I mean, isn't Jesus insti instilling by the very nature of asking those three to come and go through this? Isn't he really saying to them, I, I trust that you will be with me even to the end? Quick smell of that. Would it, would it not make more sense? I understand what you're saying, but would it not make more sense if I'm looking for support? I'm gonna call Father. Send me a few angels down here. I need some help, you know. So why does he why does he ask for the human? I think it was also important that they witness the event as well. He was still under that dirt, being a man, but he's also well being the. Why would he ask for the support? I mean, is there any connection that, that you have three disciples, human beings? What the have, Trinity? You have um, <clears throat> him praying three times. Trinity. Right? The sanctuary is set up in three different Trinity. sections. Yeah, right? Daniel, you have the three Hebrew worthies. And the three Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace. I mean... Um, there seems to be some element of, uh, of this number. There's some element of this number that, that is significant. Uh, we find, that, of course, the Godhead, uh, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Just everything exists in a three time, space, matter. And... Right. Well, do you think this means anything? I mean, well, you, think it's it's ar you think it's arbitrary? No, it's got to mean something or it wouldn't be there. Okay. The, I may not know what it means, but I know it's important. Sure. Sure. I think what, it, what it's doing overall is showing you that, you know, really, everything comes down to this moment in the Garden of Eden. You didn't realize that, right? Everything comes down to this moment in the Garden of Eden. In fact, uh, when you look at, at uh, it says, uh, Christ was now standing in a different attitude from which he had ever stood before. He, he's, he's looking as a substitute and surety for sinful man. Well, he was things. being a man all the way, you know. I mean, he was, he lived a perfect life. So he was uh, uh, good enough to, uh, with that perfect life, to uh, be the sacrificial lamb for all mankind. As you go through Desire of Ages and you go through this, this, this idea of him coming and praying, uh, turning away, Jesus saw it again, his retreat, fell prostrate, overcome by the horror of a great darkness that had enveloped his soul. The, the humanity of the Son of God trembled in the trying hour. In the trying hour, he prayed not, not now for his disciples that their faith might not fail. And I think that's why he, he had those three there trying to strengthen their faith. But for his own tempted, agonized soul, he's praying. Now notice this. The awful moment had come. That moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Now, if you go to the book of Revelation and you look at the seals, right? And you look at Revelation. If you go, go into chapter 6 and look at the seals, the third seal, right? The third seal, I believe, is uh, this experience that Christ is having in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he opened the third seal, I heard a... a the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and beheld a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. You know, like the balancing scales? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
can go one way, it can go the other way, right? And I mean, this there's no question that this is exactly what's happening. This this seal that's opening is referring to Christ's experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, "A quart of wheat for for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil or the wine." But when you when you look at what was being taught there. That was basically one day's provisions for a person. Okay, what's what's being so what is being suggested under this under, to John here is that the decision is not the decision that Christ is going to have to make is going to be made right now. He doesn't have he's not going to have the pleasure of of uh, going home you know and sleeping on it for a day and contemplating it for a week or a month and and, and weighing all the possibilities. No. He has, he's going to make the decision and the choice right here, right now, this moment of time. Okay? That's, that's what's being portrayed here. Question. We know that Jesus is praying to the Father. And it's not in Scripture. It's not written. But do you not think that maybe the Father spoke to him and encouraged him so Yes, absolutely. He, because, he, I mean, face it. If, if my son was to come to me and beg me for him, I'm sure going to give him encouragement. And Father's greater than us, so you know he's found to, even though he knows he's going to go through this, he had to, he had to hear something from him in order to keep going. We'll read that in just a second here. In verse 39 it says, He went a little further than, than the three disciples. He fell on his face and he prayed. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Okay. So he's feeling the separation. Separation is beginning. It's taking place. He's feeling the, 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 the weight of sin. The wrath of God is, uh, I mean, before, he's totally in harmony with his Father. Now he's experiencing the wrath of God against transgressors, against transgression. Okay. <laughs> And so he is, in his humanness, he's crying out, let, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, he doesn't want to feel, I mean, if you, 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 when, you, when you're close to God, you don't want to feel distant from him. You don't want, uh, you're, if you're walking in the light, you don't want the darkness to overcome you and to overtake you. You want to walk in the light. You know, that's where you know you need to be, right? And so the sin is causing separation. But, but you can imagine the sin of the entire world uh, that, that uh, he's, he's paying for here, right? So he comes back to the disciples, and what does he find when he, when he comes back Sleep. to them? They're sleeping, right? Now, I'm sure the hours are, are it's getting late, right? I'm sure they've had a long day, oh, and fatigue is setting in, right? And the only thing he asks of them is just basically stay awake and pray with me. Right. Uh, do they really know what's going on here? You know, now they may have even went to sleep and I've done it myself. They may have went to sleep praying. They could have been praying and went to sleep. Okay, I feel confident to su suggest that they started out praying. Sure. And mm -hmm. they started out uh, fulfilling that request, right? But then when you, when you stop, when you stop and slow down, if you sit, right? And the blood starts starts to, to slow down. You start to, you know, you start to drift off, right? I have gone to sleep praying and woke up. You know, I don't know how long. Okay. Yeah. So he comes. Back. So why didn't why didn't Jesus just uh, uh, look over there, see that they were sleeping? He may have been too far away, right? And and, and, and not not actually go to them. Why why, why just why, why get up and use all that energy to go to them? Because he had to wake him up so that he could pray. He was tired. He needed help. Could you not watch with me one hour? He knew that they were coming to get him. What uh, the soldiers was coming to get him. That's the reason he had them watching. Well, I guess he, 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 he knew that. for at least an hour. I guess it's Jesus knew that, but they didn't know that, yeah. right? Yeah. And we know that he had been praying for at least an hour. Okay. Could, not, could you not watch with me one hour? Um, if we think that, if we think as we go, if, as we head very rapidly to this time of the end, 
um, if we think that it's going to be less difficult, less trying, less stressful in any capacity, we have deceived ourselves. It's going to be it's going to be ramped up so much so that <clears throat> we are going to be pushed to the limit. Well, what is what does Scripture promise us? I I will I promise that no temptation will overtake you, such as common demand, and I will make a way of escape. We looked at that all last month, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've got those promises that God knows what we're capable of. He knows what we can handle, <clears throat> even though we are going to be pushed to the very limit. Okay. The disciples here were, were being, in a sense, pushed to that limit. Christ is making it obvious to them that, you know what, guys? You're really letting me down here. You're really letting me down, you know? Uh, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So, again, he goes a second time. Now, this look at the prayer this time as compared to the first prayer. The first prayer was... Uh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Okay, that's the first prayer. What's the second prayer? Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. What's the difference in the two prayers? He's already seen it. It's not going to pass away. Right. The, 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 the first prayer... Is, is, is really answered. You have asked him for a way out. Right. In other words, because because the burden of sin is not lifted from him, because his father doesn't come to him, he knows He knows what the answer is to that first prayer. Sure. Doesn't he? Yeah. And so, and so now he's saying, basically, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So he, you're starting to see him yielding um, his will to the possibility that this is going to play out. I'm not going to be rescued miraculously. This is going to play out. And I just need to, the assurance that the Father's plan will play out just as, as, as he wills it to, to happen. Okay? As he wills it to happen. <clears throat> So he comes back again, and what does he find the second time? Sleep. He finds him sleeping again. Sleep. And so he goes. He he, um, <clears throat> he left and went back the third time. He didn't, well, remember though, this time here he didn't even bother to wake him up. He didn't wake him up, and he says this, well, he goes back and prays again home. the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, "Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand." Um, what are, what are God's people? You know, as, as we near the end of the human probation, what is John in the book of Revelation? How does he picture God's people? Asleep. But they're asleep, aren't they? They're not wide awake and alert and, and watching and praying and uh, uh, really, they're, they're oblivious to what's about to come onto the world and onto them in their lives. They're oblivious to it. So, <clears throat> so this story here, this experience here, very much parallels. The experience that the that Laodicea uh, is going to happen as we get closer to the end. Laodicea is sleeping. They're sleeping on because the flesh is weak, right? And they're not watching and they're not praying, which is what they need to be doing, right? And so this is what this is another indication as to why God will allow many of those in Laodicea to go to sleep in death, right? To be laid to rest because they will not be able to go through. The circumstances at the end of time, okay, and uh, <clears throat> there's, there's no question there's a, there's a, there is a parallel here, right. and so we know the rest of the story that once uh, once um, <clears throat> the people are awakened, then of course um, the Judas and the high priest and the soldiers come. Mm -hmm. And they go through the, the uh, process of arresting Jesus, yeah, yeah, yeah. which in itself was quite a phenomenal story. We'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. Wait a minute. Are we asleep? Are we? Are, are we asleep? Are we asleep? Like the, like the three were? When we were taken oh. study and we're asleep most of the um, time. What happened? What happened after, shortly after Jesus went back the third time and woke them up? What happened? 
They get up because the high priest is coming, the soldiers are coming, the betrayer is coming, right? Um, Laodicea is asleep, right? God is trying to wake them up because what is coming? The betrayers are coming, the religious organizations are coming, the government is coming, right? Don't you understand? You see the parallel here? All to get Jesus and his people. All to arrest those who are honoring the truth. One of them fled naked, didn't they? Yeah. And it says, Rise, let us be joy, behold, he is a hand that doeth betray me. And is that true? That's in the, actually, that's in Mark. In that particular, there's one verse that talks about that in the book of Mark. It's not even mentioned in Matthew. He almost got caught, but he got his coat, he's got his robe on, took off. <laughs> got his robe, took off, right. Right so, off, naked into the woods. So again, somebody's being accosted, but they run off naked into the woods. I mean, again, I, I, that's a picture of guys, people wilderness. fleeing into the wilderness well, with nothing, right? Going yeah. with nothing, flee, fleeing into the wilderness. Um, because of the circumstances playing out. Okay. Were they all going to be arrested? <laughs> because they grabbed them. Don't do one of those. Were they all to be arrested that night or just Jesus? Well, you remember Jesus twice. What they say. Twice. He says, whom do you seek? Yeah. Right? And, of course, the first time what happened? They fell back and yeah. fell down. When, when, when oh, he, he said, said, he said that it, I am. Now, why, why did they, why did they, what, what was going on there? What was going on? Because I'm getting well, you're to read the just betrayed him and led, and led the Pharisees and the guards to arrest yeah. Christ. Right. But what, <laughs> how, what, yeah, how did the, how did the people that were there to arrest him, how did they end up getting knocked down on the ground? They were knocked down. Just, just they, they were knocked down to the ground like dead men. How'd that happen? Well, that's there was one He said, I am he. They were at the tomb. That's right. He said, I am he. What did he say? What was it that he just said? What did Moses hear in the burning bush? I am the lamb. That is the sacred name. Mm. That is God identifying himself. And when he said that, he was saying, I am God. Because he's claiming to be God. That's blasphemy. Benny Hinn seems to have a gift. Well, that's going to go on. What happened to Jesus in Gethsemane? Um, in remember, as he's going through this chain of prayer, trust is is building, is developing. Okay? <laughs> right? He's weighing. He had. The, he's weighing in, in in the scale. He's weighing the balances. Humanity's being weighed in the balances. Okay. If you read through the chapter in uh, on Gethsemane in, in the Czar of Ages, it uh, is very insightful. Um, what does God do? What does God do to prevent His Son from dying? That's an angel. That's an angel. He sends an angel. Oh, you mean in the garden? In the garden. Itself. In the garden. Oh, yeah. Okay, so in Luke chapter 21 or 2, I think it was. Uh, I think it's 22. 21 or 2. 22. Yeah. Uh, God sends an angel there to strengthen him. Now, he's already he's already been uh, sweating blood. You know, we talked about that initially, which is called uh, hematidrosis. It's where the capillaries in the skin actually burst. And the, the blood, of course, then has access into the, the pore, into the pores and the sweat, sweat glands, and you actually sweat blood. Okay? Uh, and that's because you're under such mental stress, <clears throat> such uh, anxiety, uh, that your your body will actually respond in that way. Okay? Uh, it's actually a medical condition. <clears throat> 
But God sends an angel. Uh, let's see here. Um, whenever Jesus there, you know, told me he could ask his God for a legion of angels. You yeah. know. Now, last week we mentioned this. Um, there's, there's a reason why God is not going to allow his son to die right there. Okay? I mean, Jesus had made the decision, your will, Father. He asked him first, take this cup from me. And then he, then he realizes that's not going to happen. So then he says, if I've got to drink this cup, your will be done. And let it play out exactly according to, to your will as necessary. He, he makes the decision, he makes the choice right there to, to become the sacrifice for humanity. Okay? But he's, he's still going to die because he's under such tremendous anxiety and, and emotional stress. He's going to die right there. And, and so what God does is God prevents them. And people don't understand that God is actually stepping in and preventing his son from dying right. Even though he shed blood and even though he made the choice to become the substitute, the, the, the sacrifice, God steps in and says, I cannot let you die right here. I need you. Okay. He it's the wrong place and the wrong time. It's the wrong place and it's the wrong time. Okay? And, and now he has to allow him, he, he's going to go through, of course, this whole uh, process too of being arrested, which again is the example for us today that the church and the state and, and even family, even close relatives or whatever, will betray you. Okay? So all that is, is allowed to take place to be an example to us, to show us what's going to happen in the near future. Yeah, well, Lord, see, they all went before the, the, the top dogs, you know, in the church and the town, you know. Correct. They, they're the one that drug him here and there and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, tried to make him look bad by spitting on him and calling him uh, everything. Yeah. What's, what's God doing? What's God accomplishing by allowing his son to be arrested and to take him, you know, into the, let, let the government get a hold of him and, and, and interrogate him and et cetera, et cetera. What's the, what's the purpose in all that, you think? For the right time and for... I guess yeah, give the Christians more. He's confronting right. them. He's confronting them, isn't he? He's well, confronting, confronting them. Not only that, but now let's remember now <clears throat> the whole <clears throat> entire universe, unseen worlds are watching this play out. Correct. And they are sitting here and not really, I mean, they know who their king <clears throat> is on this. But this is right here is going to show just how evil Satan is. That he is the one in the wrong, and that God's character is perfect. Right, an innocent, an innocent and person is is being is being brutally. persecuted, brutally persecuted, to try to gain control of of his, of his being of his of his of his no, the prince. And as Kenny's saying too, there's a timing issue. The the Passover lamb was sacrificed when? At three o'clock. Three p.m. Right. on the day of the Passover. Okay. And so, so they they have to allow for time. He has to get out of the garden. He has to go through, you know, a whole experience of back and forth like a ping pong. Well, see, they could have arrested him, took him straight to jail, waited at 9 o'clock in the morning, took him out and hung him. But, in order to just see how evil and how far Satan had fallen and how much hate he had, they had to go through this supposed trial. Right. They had to make it look legitimate. Yeah. Right. Even though the, the whole trial was just a complete... Yeah. Well, yeah. That's all it was. He wasn't even guilty. Right. In the, in the, uh, in the Jewish jurisprudence system, if, <clears throat> if all of those that were in attendance, if all the Sanhedrin voted guilty, then the person free. automatically went free. Mm -hmm. Automatically. Because they, they knew in their, in their own uh, bylaws 
they set it up that way because they knew that you couldn't get 70 people or the, the number that were there to believe that to, to look at the same come to the same conclusion about anything if it was just a say that well also they said that it proved a conspiracy because that person had no defender or intercessor right so and they were supposed to to vote from the uh, uh, youngest to the oldest that didn't happen um, so that the older members didn't influence the younger members, well, etc. I mean, this, to, yeah, there were all kinds of things that they violated. And like four o'clock, five o'clock, the yeah, morning so was the rent his garment, but they're supposed to <laughs> right. be in after, after sunrise. Let me come back to this right here for a second. It says, The world's unfallen, and the heavenly angels had watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close. Satan and his confederacy of evil. The legions of apostasy watched intently with great <clears throat> that watched intently this great crisis in the work of redemption. The powers of good and evil waited to see what answer would come to Christ's thrice repeated prayer. Angels had, had longed to bring relief to the divine sufferer. Now the this, whole universe, not just angels, the whole universe. But this might not be. No way of escape was found for the Son of God. In this awful crisis, when everything was at stake. When the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour, and the mighty angel who stands in God's presence, occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of Christ. The angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it, with the assurance of the Father's love. You see, he came to give power to the divine human supplement. Okay, he pointed he pointed him to the to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a reason. Now here here's the angel, which was what we know probably Gabriel, right, standing the one closest to the throne. Um, here's the angel. Here's what the angel tells him. He pointed him to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a result of his sufferings. He assured him that his father is greater and more powerful than Satan. And his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan and that the kingdom of this world would be given to the saints of the Most High. He told him that he would see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied for he would see a multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. I mean, here's Gabriel coming down saying, you're on the right track, you're in the will of God, you know, you've got to drink this cup. What's that? Yeah, you've got to drink this cup. Persevere. Persevere. Because the possibilities are absolutely astounding. Absolutely astounding. I've come to give you the power to face this, all right? So, uh, since Christ's agony did not cease, however, but his depression and discouragement left him. You can imagine. And, and see, God's people are going to go through a similar experience as they go through the time of trouble, particularly ap after probation closes. There's going to be depression and discouragement as we watch the world just literally fall apart at the, at the seams. <clears throat> and, and literally millions and billions of people with lives lost. It's going to be absolutely overwhelming. <clears throat> so we're going to have to have uh, angels strengthen us as well, I believe. I think it's interesting because the angel seems to have put it into perspective for him. You know, he exactly. Was, he and that's so sort of focused on his physical agony that yeah. he was losing the focus on what the whole thing was. There for. you go. There you go. So he had to remind him that there's billions of things at stake here. Like, if this angel had not come, which is described in, in Luke 21 or two, Luke 22. Luke 22, he would have died right there. He now, would have died right there. At this point right here, so I go out and say it. He had already made up his mind at that point right there. Okay, Father, if I had to die. If I had to be separated from you for eternity, I'm willing to do it in order to save all these millions that I'll do there for you. Because it would still, at this point, he couldn't see past the point of the grave, you see. Right. But he, he, he was willing, in his mind, he actually thought this is an eternal separation. It comes down to trust. Yeah. It comes always back to I trust. don't know how this is going to work out, but I do trust you that it will work out. It says here, the storm had in no wise abated, but he who was its object was strengthened to meet its fury. He came forth calm and serene. A heavenly peace rested upon his blood-stained face. He had borne that which no human being could, 
could ever bear, for he had tasted the sufferings of death for every man. You see, I mean, boy, that's a lot. Every man, every man. So, and of course, then that's when the uh, when the, uh, the high priest and, and Judas, that's when they show up, and and Christ uh, ends up facing them. And what happens is. There's no traces of his recent agony was visible as Jesus stepped forth to meet his betrayer. Standing in advance of his disciples, he said, Whom seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Why did they ask that when they saw him every day in the temple teaching? Why did they ask that? Well, you got to remember one thing. Remember, it says he stepped forth. His, his face is is he's gone through this experience. He's covered in blood. So. His face is covered in blood. He, he probably is a bit distorted. His hair is probably all matted and and, and whatnot. Jesus. And, and so probably there there was a bit of of uh, uh, apprehension. Well, you figure this was probably one o'clock or something. And it's dark. dark. So yeah, I'm dark. I don't think they got his out. So maybe they didn't recognize him. Okay. So anyway, he says, I am he. As these words were spoken, the angel who had lately ministered to Jesus moved between him and the mob. A divine light illuminated the Savior's face, and a dove-like form overshadowed him. In the presence of this divine glory, the murderous throng could not stand for a so moment. So the angel had to still be in the way? Is that the idea? The angel passed between them, yeah. right? And of course, Christ, then, then a bit of divinity flashed through Christ's humanity at that point. And it says the uh, murderous throng could not stand for a minute. They staggered back. Priests, elders, soldiers, even Judas fell as dead men to the ground. You would think. I just don't get it. You would think. You'd think they'd have gotten up and you said, "Have a good, uh, have a good uh, night, you, night you see. Relax, enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, let me let me bring you some tea and well, some crackers and cheese." People. <laughs> what does that say, Ken, about those people? What does that say about those people? They were fueled well, by satanic rage. Satan really had a hold of them, you know, to, there you in go. order to there them you go. to continue. And, and what do we have at the end of time? What do we have in our experience? In our experience, what's the time of trouble such as never was? Yes. And it's going on. Now, what is, it? what is the time of trouble such as never was? It's a time when full light meets full darkness, meets full darkness you see. And so here you had these people. Were, as you say, they were totally under the control of satanic powers. And here, so here you had a microcosm, if you will, of full light, meaning full darkness, right there in the garden. So powerful that they were blinded by the fact that they had just been not. God could them. knock them right to the ground, and, and they're still blind to their own condition, to their own motives, to their own spirituality. They're blinded to it. What's it going to be like at the end? So you're, you're, you're going to have people saying, we need to go get them in the name of God, in the name of Jesus. We need to get rid of these people, blah, 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 blah. Well, I find it interesting, too, that you right? mentioned that the angel stood between them, like the divinity of them uh, was still so powerful that it would have probably killed them had killed the angel them. not been in front of to them. Buffer. To yeah, buffer. Yeah, as a buffer. <laughs> buffer <laughs> some that's, a great, that's a great point, you see. That's a great point. Because at the end of time, what happens with God's people? They, they're like Moses. They come Moses? down. Was that yeah. Cassie's little thing? They come down the, the mountain, and Moses' face is shining, right? At the end of time, God's people will be so filled with the Spirit completely that they will also shine, right? No earth do we hide. Yes, we not. So again, we're seeing, we're seeing all these parallels. We're seeing Gethsemane being a little, little, just a little microcosm of what will play out on the entire planet at the end of time. <clears throat> not that we, not that the righteous are accomplishing what Jesus accomplished by a long shot, okay? But, but we are standing under conviction and trusting in God's promises and we're standing in, in conviction of the truth, right? Whereas the entire world has been brought in under the, the umbrella of Satan and are used then to try to eliminate the righteous track them, track them down, and, and get rid of them. And it will be, it'll be the churches, it'll be the government, it'll be the, the betrayers, family, friends, whatever. 
all united together under Satan's umbrella. That's what's that's what that's what we're headed toward. You know, I'm, <laughs> we're uh, going to take our election coming up here, for instance. Why do you think Ben Carson uh, is uh, behind Donald Trump now? All the rest of them are, are Catholics. Well, I think that's that. Well, I mean, of course, we're, we're jumping off the subject here, but that seems to be happening because <clears throat> he's been promised certain things under a Trump administration. And somebody like Ben Carson probably feels like, well, you know, if I can get into any kind of position, I can be a positive influence in some way. Perhaps this could be the sounding of the first Trump. <laughs> 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 I think the first trumpet has long sounded. Yeah. I think this might be the sounding of maybe yeah, not certainly another trumpet. <laughs> I'll tell you what now. I mean, there are more uh, the Catholics are getting into the government. They're getting into the Supreme Court. Oh, they have total control of the place. Yeah, Absolutely. It's, it's going to the uh, more government all the way. Yeah, any, any reasonable person looking at things object, objectively would realize that the, the, the form of government that we currently have has become very much distorted from its original purpose and intent. Intent, right. And, and should be set aside and, and a new structure that would prevent all the perversion and all the jury rigging and all of the manipulation, and something could be done. Okay. However, scripture scripture has basically told us that, that we're going down this road for a reason, and it's to bring us to this place at the right time. And so that's why things are be, are playing out the way that they are currently. Those that have their eyes open spiritually, of course, should be able to see these things and recognize them for what they are, and it's just prophecy being 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 revealed. You, 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 know, it's, uh, you can uh, tell by the weather, the uh, heavens, and all the disasters that's coming up on Earth, and it's getting faster and faster, more of them every year. Are we out of time? Are we out of time? What time is it? Quarter after twelve. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Well, then I'll say uh, some of the. I wanted to talk about some some individuals. Noah, Elijah, Gideon, Enoch. I want to talk about a bunch of people that, that demonstrate this power of trust, but we'll do that next time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much to the story, and, and of course, so much for the disciples to learn. They were going to face their own. Um, trial of trust and time of trouble, and on, on it, what's important is to recognize that there was an individual basis. I mean, individually, you know, they had to face just like Jesus. The same thing will happen with us. No matter no matter if we're with a crowd of people or wherever we are, uh, and, the, and the, the righteous will be few in number. There's no question. In fact, there will only be 144,000 around the world living saints that go through the, the last plagues, I believe, after probation closes. But, but. Uh, just, just like just like Gideon's 300, you know, they're going to have to, despite what their senses are saying to them, despite what you see, despite what you feel, despite what you hear, you're going to have to stand on trust, stand on the promises of God. And so uh, we'll talk more about that in a few weeks. I think uh, Larry or Elijah will have the service next week. And <laughs> then have the service next week, so please uh, tune in for that, and you'll be excited to hear hear what they come up with. But, <clears throat> but we, this month, our focus, uh, fr from our, my standpoint, will be on uh, on that key word trust. That's going to be so important as we go on. All the disciples during the death with that trust. They did. They all died, you know, and sure. as martyrs and. Uh, I mean, crucified, upside down, sure. yeah. all except one. Yeah. Yep. John, on the, of course, he was banished to Patmos, but uh, 
and, and it was as an old man that he does probably the, the greatest work um, with putting together the book of Revelation. <laughs> you know, so God uses this old man on, uh, in, in prison on the island. Uh, quite incredible. That, that's, where trust, that's where trust will take you. <clears throat> you trust God even through those circumstances, and God can still use you, and God will use you. So, so that's the important thing for us. Lay River Few. Anyway, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Let me just invite you to pause for a moment. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you that we can look at the examples of trust uh, from your word. And of course, the ultimate was as your son went through Gethsemane, he went through that experience. And uh, we, we can only read the words on the page and, and only pick up on some of the perhaps major circumstances there. But, but uh, how fascinating it will be to sit down with Jesus himself and, and have him share uh, that experience firsthand. We thank you, Lord, that your son was willing, willing to, to travel that road. He was willing to trust you, no matter what it felt like, no matter what it seemed like, um, no, ma no matter that, that hope, that he was discouraged and that hope seemed to have fled. But we're thankful, Lord, that you were willing to strengthen him, that he made the choice to, uh, to set us free. From uh, sin and death. So, uh, words are so easy to say. We we pray, Lord, that just as you strengthen your son to walk through his time of trouble, that you will strengthen us as well. Uh, you'll strengthen us to <clears throat> continue to make the right choices. That our lives will be a very testimony, our actions uh, a very witness that we trust you implicitly. So guide and direct and bless each one of us to that end. Be with those who are watching, who are listening. May they truly grow to trust you to that degree as well. It is what we need. It is what the 144,000 will, will have to utilize in order to walk through a time of trouble such as never was. So thank you for informing us, instructing us, blessing us to this end. And may we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. And we ask these mercies in Jesus' wonderful name. We do ask that, that as you have fed us spiritually, we pray a blessing on the, the physical food and our fellowship, that, Lord, we might be fit vessels for your use. And we ask it all in the name of your wonderful Son. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. And thank you for joining us online. And we look forward to seeing you again next Saturday. God bless.